Hey, welcome back to Neckbeardia. It's y'all's favorite fake cowboy here. Today for you we have Mahogany Port and Cuban Cigars, a TG story. Hello everybody, it's Wood Booze and Smokes Guy, alias Rambling Detroit, coming at you with today's story time. Now last time it was decided to tell you the story of the DM getting back his Illuminati cards. As you may recall, I mentioned that this story would be rather more unbelievable than the others. For I have never heard it from the direct source. The DM told it to his waifu back when they were still dating, and waifu told it to me about a year later after I joined the group, and now I am telling it to you. So a story told by a man about his exploits to a woman he's dating, told by a woman about the man she loves to that man's friend, told by that man's friend about his bro. So if you're expecting staunch realism after that, you may be out of luck. At this point, it's likely to bear as much of a resemblance to the events of that week as CSI does to actual crime lab work. The basics are there, many of the motions are the same, but the boring stuff is glossed over and the interesting bits are polished to the high gleam of awesome. This is also the first story I've told to you that takes place pre-21st century. All of the stories so far have been post-2000. This took place in 1996. I've decided to call it Not For Sale. No roster of characters this time, because this story is really only about the DM and one other man. A man that I will call Super Dave, who I must introduce to you at some length. His name was indeed Dave, and I do not call him Super Dave necessarily because of any connection with Super Dave Osborne, though of course that character is the reason Super Dave has such a nice ring to it. And he did have a bit of that gung-ho nature by all accounts. I also do not call him Super Dave because he was superhumanly awesome, though by all accounts he was. He was the DM's best bro before I came along, probably closer than we are now. I call him Super Dave because no one who knew the dude can talk about him without smiling. Everyone has an awesome story about Super Dave, and remembering those stories makes them happy. If you ask me, that's all a man needs to be called Super. I will tell you of the things that Super Dave was reputed to love. He loved D&D. He loved Traveler. He loved Doctor Who. He loved comic books. He loved buying ragged old board games at flea markets for a quarter and rescuing the dice. He loved Star Trek 2. He loved Magic the Gathering. And he loved building the most annoying decks possible and using them only once to prove they worked. He loved beer. He loved guns. He loved porn with big old titties and he loved his truck. He loved his country. He loved his mama. He loved telling people about how much he loved his country and his mama. He loved Captain America. He really, really loved Captain America. He would apparently explain this to anyone that had known him for a few months. Captain America was the greatest hero ever conceived of in fiction. He was a patriot who wanted so badly to defend his country that he was willing to die before ever being able to fight for it. And then he'd gone on to serve on the front lines and put himself in danger right alongside the rest of the boys in green. He truly, absolutely believed in America. For Super Dave, it wasn't just that Captain America believed in American ideals. It was that he'd lived those ideals, lived by them, held himself to them. That was why he wasn't just a superhero. For Super Dave, he was a personal hero. Sadly, an accident in his childhood left his left hand unable to hold anything for long periods of time or put much weight on it. Meaning that, like Steve Rogers, he was out of luck until a super soldier formula came along. He once told the DM, If I die, man, just make sure they bury me with Captain America's shield. I'll be happy. Anyway, in 1996, the DM was living a young nerd's dream. He was in his early 20s and was working as a forklift operator. 
Between a strong worth ethic and youthful energy, he was pulling overtime every night but game night. He had an awesome TV, awesome furniture, a ton of toys and gaming stuff, even if he was barely home to use it, and plenty of money to throw around on any occasion. Super Dave, meanwhile, was working at the video store. An independent place, back before the chain stores like Blockbuster had finished choking them completely out of existence. Of course, it didn't hurt that this one had an extensive porn selection in the basement, which is probably why Super Dave was so happy to stay working there, even if the salary wasn't quite as good as the DM's forklifting. <laughs> I mean, the guy has his priorities set for himself, I guess. The DM had assembled an, at the time, complete set of Illuminati cards. As to whether he'd assembled them bit by bit or bought one of the complete collections, I couldn't say. As I only even heard of the complete collections when I was trying to see how many cards that might be for telling the story. Somehow from the way he says complete when he talks about it, it seems like some effort went into that. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the video, but today's sponsor is Elemental Games. Elemental Games is the largest seller of tabletop role-playing related products in the UK, and they also sell to most other countries at a great price. With 15-25% to off Games Workshop products, it's hard to say no. However, they sell a lot more than just Games Workshop products. They sell every popular war game you can think of, as well as board games, card games and role-playing games. Thinking about picking up an airbrush and trying some new painting techniques? Or what about sprucing up your gaming table and getting some new terrain and battle maps? Then consider getting it with Elemental Games. But enough of that. Let's get back to the video. The DM loved and loves those cards. He thinks they're brilliant. Politics is one of his other hobbies, and the sort of broad political commentary contained in those cards fascinates him, apparently. He can never quite seem to articulate just what it is about them, but I get the sense that more than once he just sat there and gone through them one by one, pondering the socio-political ramifications of each one's crafting. Having your home robbed is a traumatic experience for anyone. Anyone that has ever had anything like that happen to them probably knows how the DM felt when he opened the door that evening and saw his living room in a shambles that he did not leave it in. In one window smashed the pieces. His TV was gone. His stereo was gone. His VCR and PlayStation both gone, of course. Some of his kitchen appliances had apparently been taken as well. His books and other gaming things had been thrown about as the thieves apparently just cleared the shelves to check for stuff behind them, but they all seemed to be there. But the plastic box containing his Illuminati cards? Gone. Political Dermox. <laughs> wow, okay, Capture. He called the cops, gave them as much information as he could. He was already mentally trying to make his peace with the permanent loss of his possessions, even as they were telling him they'd keep an eye on pawn shops and try to track it down. Super Dave came over and started helping him put things back in order and check for anything else that was missing. It had apparently been just a quick smash and grab, rather than trying to clean the place out, as not much else had even been gone through. They sat down to have some Guinness together. The DM likes that stuff, calls it the beer you can chew. Apparently the DM just couldn't get over the Illuminati cars more than anything. They'd probably been taken because, being in a plastic box with a clasp, the thieves must have assumed it held something valuable, like money or jewelry. But finally the DM told Super Dave that the other stuff was just stuff. It was the same appliance as anyone could have taken from them and then replaced. Everyone had a TV, everyone had a microwave, and so on. But those Illuminati, Illuminati? But those Illuminati cards were his. There was something vastly more personal about losing them, he said, than in losing the same old crap that could just be hawked in any garage sale. Well shit man, let's go find your stuff then. This isn't to say Super Dave was suggesting they go running out the door right then and into the night, roving the streets in search of the evildoers. Well, probably not. Instead, the next day they checked back with the police, and then started asking around some of the DM's neighbors. 
See anybody last night? Anyone running around carrying a TV or a PlayStation or a gray plastic box? No, hadn't really noticed anything, sorry. The next day they went around to the pawn shops themselves, and the day after that the local flea market type places. An even better place to sell stolen goods without worrying that the pawnbroker might actually follow the law and check the serial numbers, but nothing turned up. After their fruitless few days of searching, the two of them turned their feet towards their preferred local game store. Basically, they'd spent the whole morning not seeing a damn thing familiar any dusty little flea market. They were tired and a bit disillusioned. Super Dave said they might have new dice in. The shiny click clack rocks would cheer them up. <laughs> they get to the local game store and say hi to Genial Store Guy. They look around for a while, eye the shiny new dice. The DM looks a bit morosely at some of the loose Illuminati cards. Super Dave looks at them too, and that's when he tilts his head and looks behind the counter. Hey, genial store guy, anyone been in lately to sell any Illuminati cards? It hadn't previously occurred to either of them that common thieves would know what the hell a local game store was or that it existed. They hadn't taken any of the books after all. But yes, it turned out that someone had been in. Someone Genial Store Guy actually hadn't liked having in his place that much. Apparently, he was always loitering around in the general area, and occasionally needed to have the cops called on him when he was intimidating customers or looking towards the frequenters of the local game store and the pizza place on the opposite end of the strip mall to sell his weed. Genial Store Guy ran a clean shop. Didn't like seeing this dude slipping his younger customers nickel bags. Genial store guy had once or twice talked with the cops that had come along to shoo this dude away. So he actually had a fair bit of info for the DM and Super Dave. Our suspect was a tall guy with a shaved head and the number 12 tattooed on the back of his neck. It always smells like white trash. Jesus. Wore loose pants and a white tank top. Not really built, but a bit of muscle in the arms and shoulders. I guess the kind of muscle you get from carrying stolen TVs. You know how the Joker in the Dark Knight liked the bullshit about how he got his scars? This dude was apparently like that about what the 12 meant. He'd say it meant whatever he thought would impress someone or that he could get away with saying. At various times it had stood for how many men he killed. How many cops he'd killed. How many cars he'd stolen, how many girls he'd raped, how many illegitimate kids he had, or how many bags of coke he'd snorted in one night. The only one he'd claimed once or twice that apparently had any authenticity to it was that 12 was the age at which he'd first done time. Sent to juvie for hitting a Toys R Us employee with a bat and stealing a Nintendo or something. Having established that our villain defined himself by that number, we'll go ahead and call the suspect 12. Genial store guy had been surprised, unpleasantly, to see 12 actually come into his store. 12 was not the kind of guy who was interested in seeing what latest magic booster pack was out this week, which made it even more surprising when he set the box on the counter and asked if it was worth anything. Genial store guy had looked through the Illuminati cards within, Mostly just to see what was there, partially to make it seem he was considering it so as not to piss 12 off and cause a scene. A man didn't go from trying to convince people to not spend their money on that nerd shit and spend it on weed instead to having a complete set of Illuminati cards, not unless he stole them. So finally, Genial Store Guy says sorry, he just doesn't have the room for them or demand for them right now. Maybe check back later. Twelve snorts, grabs the box back, glares at Genial Store Guy, and leaves. The DM and Super Dave had their thief. Of course, knowing who it was and actually doing something about it were two different things. The DM decided that he should do the legally upright thing and give the cop assigned to his case a call. Genial store guy lets him call right from the store, and the DM tells the cop the whole thing. The cop says he'll see about talking to 12, and agrees it was probably him, but that even 12 still needs a search warrant issued on him if they want to look in his car or house or whatever. And with such circumstantial evidence, even though the boxes matched, they're not likely to get one. 
There had recently been a minor kerfluffle over a local judge issuing a search warrant on his ex-mistress. And at the moment, search warrants were harder to come by than a thread on TG that doesn't contain tits. I don't really see the problem with that. Who don't like a good titty thread with elves? The DM hung up the phone, scowling. He and Genial Story Guy were pretty annoyed, but there wasn't anything they could really do. Super Dave wasn't so sure. He around here today? At first, Genial Story Guy didn't seem to realize what he meant. Then he realized and cleared his throat before continuing. No. Twelve hadn't been around since coming in with the cards. He was either pissed off sulking somewhere over being denied or worried that he'd been made and was keeping his head down. Super Dave was not to be deterred. He got anyone he hangs out with. Come to think of it, yeah. He usually had a couple of people that would hang out with him in ones or twos. The ones most often with him tended to hang around the area anyway. Skinny teenage guy, dressed a lot like 12, had a buzz cut, sort of a mini 12 if you will. So we'll call him Six. Six apparently liked to hang out in the pizza place, previously mentioned at the other end of the strip mall. So Super Dave and the DM headed out of the local game store and down the sidewalk into the pizza place. You know those places and strip malls you go where it's always just sort of dim? That the peeling tint on the insides of the windows seemed to have somehow affected all of the light in the entire place? I've been in this pizza place and many other establishments like it. No matter how they try to update it, add new arcade cabinets, whatever, it's like it's got some sort of stasis, keeping it in an atmosphere of an earlier time. Maybe the late 70s. The air certainly seems that old. If you do deep breathing exercises in there, you could probably eventually get a second hand high. The DM and Super Dave look around. Eventually they spot what could only be Six playing Mortal Kombat 2 and they head over. The DM walks up beside Six and Super Dave standing a bit behind the DM. Six tosses them a quick look sees that they don't seem to be cops or any sort of authority figure, and ignores them with a snort as he continues his fight. Hey, I need to talk to you for a minute. Six flicks his eyes at him for a moment, but he's got that arrogance. These aren't grown-ups. They're only a couple of years older than him. He's in a public place. He's in better shape than them. What are they gonna do anyway? Fuck off, man, I'm playing. The DM scowls. He reaches over, smacks Six's hands off the controls. Kentaro basically insta-fucks him. I'm not. Six is ticked. He whirls around, acts like he's about to get into DM's face, tells him he needs to back off. The Demon Super Dave do not back off. Instead, they close in. They're not touching Six, but they've basically got him cornered up against the game cabinet. They both got their serious business faces on. Six begins to feel that maybe Bluster is not the wisest tactic. He failed his charisma check. <laughs> Man, what the hell? What's your problem? My problem is that I had a lot of my things stolen, and I want them back. We know 12 took my shit. Where is he? Man, fuck off. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. While they've got Six cornered, Super Dave has been looking him over. His serious face has turned curious. Suddenly, he smiled. Hey... I know you. You're the little punk's name. Yeah, man, you come into the store all the time. Six looks at Super Dave, face wrinkled in confusion and disgust. Then comprehension begins to dawn. The wrinkles smooth out as his eyes widen, then his whole face goes slack as it fully hits him. Super Dave works at the video store. Super Dave knows his full name. Super Dave knows his phone number and driver's license number. Super Dave knows where he lives. And that's the end of part one of the two-parter story of Mahogany Port and Cuban Cigars, not for sale. If you like the story and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to Neckbeardia and click the bell icon so you know when part two comes out next weekend. Additionally, if you like my voice, be sure to stop by Guardbeardia for even more original stories written freshly through the week in the most primo original content one can get his hands on here on YouTube.
And until we see you next time on this side of the veil, this has been Guard Bro.